so with that, though, I'll move on to our next speaker, Laura Brennan. She is founder, president, and CEO of TransTRIA LLC, a certified woman-owned small public health research and consulting company in St. Louis, Missouri, with a vision of uniting people, places, and policies to revolutionize public health. She is an assistant professor of behavioral science and health education in the Department of Community Health at St. Louis University School of Public Health. Dr. Brennan has led multiple projects at the national, state, and local levels to facilitate discussions among practitioners, researchers, providers, community members, and advocacy groups to assist them in planning efforts to address social, economic, and environmental influences on behaviors and health. Dr. Brennan has published 19 peer review articles studying behaviors and health. She is lead author on Promoting Health Equity, a resource to help communities address the social determinants of health. That's a publication of the CDC. She is also co-author on Tailoring Health Messages, Customizing Communication with Computer Technology, and is co-author on Local Government Actions to Prevent Childhood Obesity. And last, she is president in the, of the board for the Missouri Family Health Council. Help me in welcoming Dr. Brennan. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I am going to ask all of you to step out of the healthcare agency mode for a little bit with me and into the community mode. Um, a lot of the work that we do has healthcare agencies as partners, but also many other different community partners at, at the forefront. And so um, we're going to talk about social determinants of health um, from a little bit more broad perspective of the community. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, try to undertake the challenge of talking about our work around social determinants of health in 10 or 12 minutes. Um, and I realize um, just up front that I'm not going to be able to do justice to explaining all of the work that we're doing. So if you have any questions for me, please feel free to come up and see me afterwards. Um, we have essentially five different projects that touch into social determinants of health work in different ways. One of them, um, the workbook on your tables, uh, comes from work that we've been doing collectively with the CDC since about 2003. Um, it involves developing that workbook and then uh, developing a series of trainings. Uh, the trainings are both train the trainer and trainings in the community. Um, we did this in large part with the REACH program of the CDC. This is their racial and ethnic com community, or, I'm sorry, approaches to community health acronyms. Um, always a challenge, but uh, it's really opened our eyes a lot to thinking about social determinants of health from the community perspective. And from that community perspective, we've learned that it's really important to get to action. And one of the challenges about talking about health disparities is that health disparities just describe differences and are really a researcher perspective to uh, social determinants of health. And the communities really hold us accountable to, well, OK, we know that those differences exist, but how do we address them? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that in terms of a few projects that we're working on. Um, we've done a lot of work to evaluate around um, mostly childhood obesity strategies in communities. Um, uh, the evaluation of active living by design uh, has been a project we've been working uh, on for uh, past, I guess, three or four years now. And we've been evaluating 25 communities across the US who've been doing work to really build partnerships at the local level um, across multiple sectors, transportation, planning, parks and recreation, um, healthcare agencies, public health departments, and others um, with the communities themselves and trying to mobilize the communities to create action um, around policy and environment change. Likewise, that has grown into evaluation of healthy kids, healthy communities. And this is uh, 50 sites now that we're uh, looking at uh, across the US and one in Puerto Rico um, and trying to address how, how do you create these changes, not just for improving physical activity, but also healthy eating. And then uh, we've been doing a lot of work uh, at lunch. We heard a lot about the importance of evidence. Um, we've been trying to do our due diligence and trying to look at what is the evidence around policy and environment change and around social determinants of health um, with that, our review project. And then finally, what I think is probably the most exciting piece, um, but I won't be able to go into much depth here, is um, the system dynamics modeling. We've been doing some work with Washington University in St. Louis and uh, to really look at how the systems um, interact at the local level. And so with that said, I'm gonna talk briefly 
Um, actually, I'll acknowledge some of my partners. I've already mentioned the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, also the Active Living by Design organization in uh, North Carolina, Washington University and St. Louis University, and then my organization, TransTRIA. Um, as I mentioned, we worked with 25 communities across the U.S. for the Active Living by Design and learned from them, worked with them. They've helped to shape and formulate a lot of the ideas that I'll share. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge them, as well as the 50 communities who have helped to um, really uh, encourage the thinking about how to incorporate social determinants into the way that we think about policy and environment changes. And then we have a whole series of policymakers, um, practitioners, advisors, researchers who've also been working with us at the national level. So this is the workbook that's on the tables. I think one of the things that I've heard a lot um, today is uh, we've thrown around terms like health disparities, health inequities, social determinants of health. And as uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation report indicates that those terms need um, to have some common language, some common understanding. One of the things that we've found in working with communities is that um, as you talk about health disparities and you talk about health disparities as just differences because that's what um, disparities are. So, for example, I'm at much higher risk being a woman for breast cancer than I am for prostate cancer. Well, that's a health disparity, right? But that's a passive way of looking at how do we uh, really address what is what our main concern health inequities. And so as we begin to talk about the differences between health inequities and health disparities, we begin to look at some of the um, unjust systematic differences, some of the power differences that occur in communities and that we observe. And, we, and that's how we begin to talk about social determinants. And I think that that's really an important piece um, as we move to address social determinants at the community level because it's not going to be through just identifying the differences that exist. It's going to be through a really um, articulate way of understanding the health inequities and what, what is at the root cause of those health inequities. And so we've heard about poverty and um, race, and we've heard about um, discrimination, and we've heard about uh, education. And so really thinking about those at the community level and what that means, and I'll give you a couple examples if I have time. Uh, this image is in the workbooks, and uh, we, we use this to really talk about social determinants of health. And so I know you can't read it, so I'll reference you to the workbooks, um, and hopefully everybody gets um, the slides afterwards. But in the soil in this image of the trees is really where we talk about those being the social determinants. If we don't build and nurture our communities, um, by giving people quality education, access to healthy foods, access to health care, health insurance, clean environments, um, transportation resources, all kinds of things like that, then we're not really creating a community that allows people to have an equitable opportunity to engage in healthy behaviors and to have, lead healthy lifestyles. And then the, the tree trunks um, really are about the communities themselves. What do we witness in the communities in terms of civic engagement and participation, local leadership, social networks, um, engagement across businesses, economic development, all of those pieces at the local level is really how we um, see those social determinants influencing and interacting to create different communities, more and less healthy communities. And it's not in the top of the tree that we're going to eliminate all health um, problems or all risk behaviors. That's not the case, but we're going to create more equity and, and more um, consistency across communities and the resources that they have and therefore minimize uh, exposure to different risks for health complications. And so I, we also have in there a sort of flow chart, if you will, and, and I'm going to say right now that when I come back to systems, um, and you'll see why it gets really complicated really fast in a minute, but um, these flow charts only provide one direction of relationship, and so we're moving uh, from social determinants, looking at the top at the differences by different groups, by socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, disability status, geographic location, all of those kinds of 
differences in the way, um, as Dr. Sullivan said, resources are distributed across communities and how that influences health promoting behaviors and then health outcomes. But we're not looking at the loops, the reinforcing loops, and I'm gonna come back to that in a minute, which is a really important piece um, to understanding how these, um, not these disparities and inequities get created, but how they get sustained in communities. Um, this just uh, illustrates that um, we have a process that we recommend to different communities for how to begin to think about social determinants from the assessment, traditional sort of evidence-based approaches, uh, doing assessment, doing um, intervention approaches, and then evaluation. And a lot of the approaches that we talk about in here are a little bit different in, in terms of intervention strategies that we would think about for addressing um, health promoting programs or services. Um, really looking at social action, consciousness raising, community development, and then other structural or policy changes and media advocacy. I love the lunch presentation because it really highlights the importance of um, putting social determinants out there in the front and talking honestly about these problems in the community. Um, this is the evidence um, piece that we, we've been working on, and I'm not gonna spend any time here because I could spend a long time here, but the idea in, in terms of the evidence and the research is really trying to build the, um, the case for why social determinants are related to these different factors and how those pathways serve to influence and reinforce some of these uh, different social determinants that we see pervasive in certain communities and, and not as pervasive in other communities. Um, I really love this logic model. It's part of the uh, work that we've been doing with the Healthy Kids, Healthy Communities. And for those of you who uh, deal with logic models, it looks nothing like a logic model. Um, at, logic models move from the left hand to the right hand side of the page and have all of these sort of arrows and lines and boxes that link all of these individual little factors. And we took that kind of logic model to nine of our 50 communities and we said, here's what we're thinking about for evaluating the work that you're doing that is really cross-sector, multidisciplinary, policy, environment, systems, change, approaches. And they said, that is not gonna work for what we're doing. And so we actually brainstormed with those communities and they, they suggested this sort of pyramid kind of uh, shape. And what I wanna uh, highlight here, uh, this is all around childhood obesity and it brings in um, you know, the children, the families, the homes, the promotions and programs in the community, the policies at the local level, national, uh, state, and industry policies, and then that purple layer is, is the macro social systems. And really uh, what they talked about was, it's not just that we need to focus on creating infrastructure and policy change in communities, but we need to also talk about transformational processes. And what that looks like is building local leadership, building capacity in the community, building economic development opportunities in the community, training opportunities, job opportunities uh, that start and, and end in the community. So um, these are all factors that um, we've been talking about um, that then end up going into what I was um, talking about earlier with the system dynamics modeling approach. And um, a lot of people have referred to this as uh, spaghetti and meatballs. Um, so I don't know if, if that's how it appears to you, but um, that's certainly uh, one of the ways that we've used, uh, built off of to describe it. But here is where you begin to really map out these pathways and these relationships. And these models, um, through the work that we're doing with Washington University in St. Louis, actually get built with the communities through a process called group model building. And it's actually the communities that are telling us what goes in these boxes, what these arrows look like. And what's really important about this is, as we think about, for example, a healthy um, nutritional strategy in the community, and we think about policy and environment change, for example, there's a lot of talk now about sugar-sweetened beverage taxes. Um, historically, we've done a lot of nutrition labeling um, and, and other types of approaches. But if you don't have an access to a grocery store or a farmer's market or anything like that in your community where you can actually get um, foods, and if those foods that you do get in your community are part of a, 
um, convenience store or, or gas station, or, and that's where primarily you get access to your foods, it's not going to matter whether there's a sugar-sweetened beverage tax or whether there's WIC reimbursement for food, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and other policies like that. So when we talk about social determinants of health, it's really important to talk about it at the local level and think about what access people have to different resources. Um, and I could spend a lot more time here, so I apologize, but um, I uh, wanted to at least give you some access. We have some different resources online. Um, the, the workbook is the first one here, but we've also done a lot of publications, um, and there's a best practices special issue for some of the work that happened across the 25 communities. 15 actually uh, wrote up their work um, around building local leadership, building resources and partnerships across sectors. Um, and one great example for those of you who are healthcare agency focused is the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus um, in Buffalo, New York. They actually uh, have been so successful at partnering with the local communities around their uh, institution and actually have now built a, a model where they're leading efforts at the local government level to address um, active living and healthy eating strategies for the whole uh, city of B Buffalo. So, and it all started in the healthcare agency. So I, I think that there's a lot of opportunities here, a lot of um, partnership, and um, I think my time's up. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brennan.